stiff doesn't make me any difference. <laughs> it is good to be in Lakeland. That's where I'm at, right? Right. When's the last time y'all heard that? <laughs> I got some plans for this. Uh, I am one who believes, just like Jesus, we got an imperishable body waiting on us. Imperishable. You don't know what that means. Look it, look it up when you get home, and it will blow your mind. So I'm planning on doing a lot of things on one of these in the afterlife. It's <laughs> imperishable now. If I try it, I'll be dead. <laughs> Since we won't die in the next life. Okay, you win. <laughs> I have to tell you that I've come all the way from Louisiana to tell you that I sincerely appreciate your support from the bottom of my heart as I speak for my family. If you're just wandering in off the street, we got a little show called Duck Dynasty. such a weird idea to have a functional family that gather around a table and pray to an almighty living God. So I want to thank you for that. I tell you, of all people, I got an uncle you might have heard of. He's a little bit out there. He really believes that a lot of things that we see in, in our zoos, you know, things like real black panthers, he believes they live in our woods. Man's messed up. But he did say something on the set of the TV show that I want to share with you because it's really how we are and what we're based on. We decided from day one that we were not going to compromise on our faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. And we also decided that for the sake of drama, that we were not going to manipulate and betray members of my family. <coughs> we were going to stick together. And we've done that. And we decided not to compromise on our duck seasons. And every year we go duck hunting. We make the camera people off. You know, so I said something one day, uh, you know, they can be frustrated. They, uh, they have ideas and they try to get us to do things that we're not going to do. And I always said, you know what, I'm going to show up and I'm going to be myself. And if people like this, this is something I know I can reproduce. <laughs> and that's what we do. And I would venture to say that even though we have an editing process and there's producers and directors, I will say that I believe this is truth, that we are probably the most realistic reality show in the history of reality show. <laughs> so I had enough one day, and the director was barking orders, and so I said, hey Jack, let me tell you something. He said, you're not directing this. Of course, the guys from LA, it's a bit of a culture shock dealing with my family. He's looking around, thinking Sai's talking about somebody else or to some of his imaginary friends. He's like, you, you talking to me? I said, hey Jack, you're not directing this. Let me, let me let you in on something. God Almighty is directing this. You're just along for the ride. <laughs> that even last year an average of over 10 million people just in the U.S. would watch this show. And it's now available in over 100 countries. Where it is. I do believe that even though our show is not really about our faith, it shows who we are and the prayer itself plants a seed in the minds of people who want to know more about this real living God that we serve. And I'm just glad to be along for the ride myself. 
I brought my better half today. I want to introduce her so she can wave. It's my lovely wife, Missy. Thank you for being here. She's been married over 20 years. She's my best friend and my spiritual partner. And uh, we made a decision while we were dating to remain pure before we got married. And guess what? Our lives were never in danger at any point. <laughs> we made a spiritual decision that we want to go to heaven and we want to bring as many people with us as possible. That's what I'm doing in Lake Bend today. <clears throat> when this started, I was in New York of all places. Willie was fixing to have his first meeting with A&E executives. I was going to do a duck call seminar in New Jersey. I was just going to see the Yankees play baseball and blow, blow the duck calls and, you know, talk about duck hunting. And I thought this was just ridiculous that he was going to meet with somebody about actually having a national TV show about our family. I mean, I, I was not a believer. But anyway, we're standing outside their offices. We're drinking $4 cups of coffee because that's all we can find. And a man walks by and dropped some coins in my brother's coffee cup. <laughs> he gets mad because now he's got to go buy another cup of coffee. I get tickled about it. And he's like, why do you think this is so funny? I said, I'll tell you why this is so funny. Because this gentleman walked by at a brisk pace. You know, everybody walks fast in New York. And I said, he quickly figured out that you are way more pathetic looking than I am. <laughs> Who would have thought? Here we are, people thinking we're homeless. <laughs> and God has used this to open doors all across this globe. And that's why I've come out here. Look, there's a lot of misinformation about our family because what happened is that a lot of you support this idea of getting off the planet alive through Jesus Christ. And it's been great, the support that we've gotten. But a lot of people were sitting there and they're watching TV and they, they're like, wait a minute, whoa, whoa. These bearded rednecks are actually fixing to pray to God on national TV. Something must be done. <laughs> and so we've been persecuted a bit for our faith. And, uh, you know, I don't know, you probably heard about the encounter my dad got into. He quoted a verse in an interview the guy didn't even know it was a Bible verse. And the next thing you know, as I said, a national controversy broke out. If y'all hadn't noticed this, my dad can be a little bit blunt. He does not compromise on what God Almighty says. And look, I want to be clear. We're not policemen. We don't go around and stick our noses into people's lives. We go around and we spread the grace of God through Jesus Christ. That's our weapon. The grace of God teaches us to say no. But when we're asked a specific question... We're going to give a biblical, God-sanctioned answer. And we're not going to shrink back from that. We don't compromise on the truth. There are decisions that are made. And we believe that God's way is always the best way. Now, I want to give you a crash course on what we do. Uh, these are duck calls. Or party favorites. You know what duck hunt. They are, uh, you know, the sophisticated title for this is Air Traffic Controllers. <laughs> Some of you getting this? Some of y'all getting on here. What this is, is good, clean fun. Uh, there, was a, there was a problem in the duck hunting industry when my dad invented Duck Commander Duck Calls, and here was the problem. The, the logic was, if you build a souped up duck call and you win the duck calling championship, then that qualifies you to make your own duck calls. And that was just kind of the way people did it. 
Here was the problem with that. If you go to the World Championship Duck Calling Contest in Stuttgart, Arkansas, that's held every year, this is what you're going to hear. People get up one right after another and they go. I've never heard a duck do that. <laughs> I've been in the woods my entire life and I've never heard a duck do anything close to that. And these large men who do that, they look, some of them will pass out. <laughs> They'll crown a chain. And my dad said, you know what? I'm going to build something that actually sounds like a duck, a real live duck. People all across the industry said that'll never work. You get to thinking that duck hunters are not real smart here. An actual mallard hen will do three things. She'll do a feed call. You say, now when does she do that? When she's eating. That's why it's called a feed call. Oh, I'm not, some of you are not duck hunters. I see in your eye. You're lost right now. You're thinking, hey. I'm looking for the next chick to lay. I'm not worried about it. <laughs> Here's what we did. We get painted pieces of plastic that look like ducks. And then we make these sounds with these duck calls. And the ducks, when they look, they say, hey, there's a party going on down there. So we call them. We'll do quacks, because a mallard hen does that. <laughs> And we'll do a greeting call. That's, hey, come on down. Everything's all right here. <laughs> when they get close enough, then we shoot them. <laughs> we clean them. We cook them. And we eat them. We do it every year. It's great. Great for you. No, we were organic before that became cool. We go to Dodge grocery store and we say, okay, yeah, I'm going to take two of these and one of those. Now, some of you, that bothers you, I know. So, I'm going to take this, this idea and I'm going to take this opportunity to share something with you that you might not have read in this book. And I do believe that this is God inspired. In Genesis chapter 9, right after Noah and the ark, you remember that story? There was sort of a movie about it this year. <laughs> so, Genesis 9, let me, from God's point of view, right after the flood, the water goes down, and he says this, and I'm going to quote this for you. He says, he was talking to Noah and his family, he said, the fear and dread of you, humans, will fall upon the beasts of the earth, the birds of the air, the crawlers of the ground and the fish of the sea. Everything that lives and moves will be food for you. Now if you can imagine that setting, you can probably imagine the animals going, <gasps> Back to the text. Just as I gave you the green plants, you say, what's the five? I just gave you the five food groups from God Almighty Himself. In case you missed it, He said to Noah and his family, anything that walks, crawls, flies, swims, or grows will be food for you. I get my orders from headquarters. Now look, if you want to you know, shoot you a duck and put him on the grill. I'm telling you, God said, go for it. They'll run or they'll fly. <laughs> if you just want to eat broccoli and Brussels sprouts, knock yourself out. <laughs> if you want to watch me eat both, great. <laughs> but I tell you this, I believe that was the birthplace of honey. And we, don't get me wrong, we love animals. We have pets. We don't eat them all. <laughs> But every year, during duck season, it gives us an opportunity that I think carries out God's design. 
Because look, we're humans. We're not animals. There's a difference. Whenever we're in a society where an animal is viewed more valuable than a human, that's a recipe for ruin, misery, and disaster. There are some laws that are more penal if you bend down and pick up a bird's feather and put it in your pocket than looking at an unborn baby human being and looking at that and saying, oh, it's no big deal. You kidding me? Where did life come from? I believe that God Almighty in His infinite wisdom created each one of you in your mother's womb. And that what David said in Psalm 137? We're not junk. You're not an accident. You're not a mistake. God made you on purpose. That's what Paul said in Acts 17. Oh, it's a wonderful reading. Read that with again on Acts chapter, chapter 17. God determined the exact times for them and the exact places where they should live. From one man, He created all nations of men. That's why we're not racist. That's why there's one race. The human race. Amen. Well, the only color I'm worried about is the red blood of Jesus. We were all created from heaven. On purpose for a purpose. And you say, well, how did this come about? Well, the reason I got into the duck calls and, and hunting is because when I was a kid, my dad, he was not a follower of Jesus Christ. And by his own admission, he was a terrible human being. He was not a good father. He was not a good husband. He was abusive. Whenever I saw him, I ran out of fear. And then all of a sudden, I see this incredible transformation. I mean, incredible. I'm like, what? what happened here? And in an effort to change his lifestyle, he started spending time with his kids. Guess what? They're not going to grow up to be model citizens on their own. It doesn't happen by accident. You're going to have to spend some time with your kids, get in their life. This is something you've got to consciously make a decision to do. At my house, we have what we call come to Jesus meetings all the time. We say, look, the Lord loves you and we love you. It's time for you to make a few changes. But here's my dad. In an effort to become a better dad, he starts taking me duck hunting. And I had my first experience with God, not in a church building, but gazing upon this creation. Because you know what I deducted? And maybe it was because I was thankful that my dad was taking me duck hunting. But I deducted, based on the details of creation, that someone, some being, designed this planet. The design of the planet demands a designer. Start looking at the details. Start looking at it. People say, oh no, Jace, you're, you're talking about this stuff just happened. Yeah, there was two rocks floating around in space. They collided. I'm like, where'd this stuff come from? They're like, don't worry about that right now. Yeah. The spark hit the mud puddle. Bam, life was formed. Well, we were fish? And now we're frying up and eating our ancestors? <laughs> we jumped out of the mud puddle. We grew a tail. It fell off. Human race was formed. No wonder you're so miserable. What's your plan to be? The best thing you can hope for is to be dead. That's what you're doing with? Look, I'm not going to judge you. I'm not going to dislike you. I'm going to wish you the best of luck because you're going to need it. There's no meaning there. Where's the meaning in life? Where's the afterlife? Where's the hope? Where's the love? Why love? Now, I'm a Romans one man. Based on what has been made, 
all men are without excuse because God's divine nature and eternal power are clearly seen. Look at the details of what's been made. This didn't happen by accident. Just because we didn't see it created doesn't mean we can't ignore God's fingerprints all over. And even in your life. And so there I was all of a sudden thinking, you know, I need to, I need to seek out this guy. My dad started growing a beard. I think he was kind of an anti-establishment type fellow. But what we did as we got older is we understood that we were not growing a beard. It was doing that on its own. I get asked that all over the where we go. Why are y'all growing the beards? It's doing that on its own. Well, what I do, this is great camouflage. It keeps my face warm. And nobody ever, under any circumstance, tries to mug you. <laughs> but I realized something at 14 is that it's the heart of a man or a woman for that matter that matters. And God changes people from the inside out. And He does it through a message. And the message is proclaimed through Jesus Christ. That's what I'm stumbling up on this. I thought it was a rule book, perhaps a fairy tale. I came to understand that it is a love letter from God Almighty to mankind. And it is a weapon of mass instruction. God Almighty in human form. Look, Genesis to Malachi, you must sum it up for you. Jesus Christ is coming to earth. Matthew to John, Jesus Christ is here. And you count time by Him whether you believe in Him or not. And Acts to the book of Revelation says, does anybody know? Jesus Christ is coming back to the earth. Amen. So don't tell me it's a big bucket and I can't understand it. what's going on. We just got it. So who is this Jesus Christ? And I realize it's hard to follow and trust and have as a relationship in the best relationship in your life, God Almighty, when you can't see it. In His infinite wisdom, He chose for us to follow Him through faith. Hebrews 11.1 1, Faith is being sure of what we hope for. I want to live forever. And certain of what we do not see. Oh, I believe God is there with all my heart. So it's hard for us to close up our eyes and picture God Almighty. And that's why He sent Jesus. Here's God in human form. John 1 says that Jesus, the one and only Son, has made God known. Even though no one has ever seen God. That's what He came for. That's what He's like. Read the book of John. Read Matthew, Mark, Luke. 100% holy. Righteous. No evil. Good. You know, if we were going to have a Savior, and a God. Doesn't it help that He's 100% righteous and holy and pure? That's who I want to put my faith and trust in. So you say, well, where did the problem start? The problem came when God gave us the ability to choose. That's God given. And your common sense and your conscience knows right from wrong. I believe that's the evidence of God. So don't believe these people when they say, oh, I had to know that's wrong. And I, oh, they know. My dad didn't say anything that this whole world didn't already know. You know right from wrong. You can get drunk every day. You can chase this high. You can have immoral sex every day. But deep down, you know right from wrong. And look, it's a dead end. It's a dead end. Where's that going to lead? 
Well, I'm just going to enjoy life. Well, how come you're so miserable? Where's the meaning? Where's the purpose? purpose? The point of Jesus Christ was to come to this earth, lead a perfect life, and die on a cross for all those times. We said, you know what? I know what my conscience says, but I'm going to do it anyway. The guilt that we experience because of our bad decisions. Hey, I've made bad decisions. I, I, I'm a sinner. All of my family, we've been real open about what we've done. You know why? Because we're forgiven. Amen. Through the grace of God. That's why Jesus came. Why Jesus said, well, I can't believe you're out there sharing about Jesus and your flaws. That's the power of God. That's how He works. So when people say, well, how come you're doing this? That's when I point to Christ. Say, because He gave me a second chance. And guess what? He gave me a third and a fourth one. And that's just today. <laughs> he loves us. It's the greatest love story ever told. It was God's idea. Three days after he was dead, a dead man, Jesus Christ, came back to life on the same earth that you're sitting on right now. Did you catch that? He's innocent and he's indestructible. Now, when I heard that at 14, I got up on the edge of my seat because I realized something. I got a problem. At some point, I'm going to die. And I don't know if you've ever considered that up until this moment, but the same thing's going to happen to you. And I've had people that they don't want to think about it. They come up to me and they're like, yeah, James, but I work out. I eat muscle sprouts and walnuts. I'm like, hey, man, you're going to die healthy. But it's going to happen. And the only way that you're going to come back to life is the same way Jesus Christ did. That is the way. He holds the power because if you can do that once, it's no longer a problem. So that's why when I heard that, the death of Jesus is going to forgive me of everything I've ever done wrong and everything I ever will do. And He was resurrected to show me that I can be resurrected from the dead. He's going around showing His scars. He's having a fish fry on the riverbank right after He was raised from the dead. People say, well, is there enough cotton in heaven? I said, well, I guarantee you there are fish fries. Because Jesus Christ doesn't do things on accident. He showed them how to catch them. He took them up. And they looked around in his eyes. Here they're staring at a man who was dead. No wonder from Acts to the Revelation, they took off and shared Jesus Christ with everybody they came in contact with. And when they were threatened, guess what they did? They stuck their head out there and said, you go ahead and cut my head off. I'd rather be beheaded than deny the power of Jesus Christ. You want some evidence? Why would anyone die for a while knowing it was a lie? If Jesus Christ hadn't come back from the dead, those men wouldn't have given their lives. They would have known it was a lie. You know what they got? They got the same thing I got at 14. I realize something. Romans chapter 8. The same Spirit, the Holy Spirit, that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, if it is living in you, will also give life to your mortal body. And the fruit of that Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, Goodness, faithfulness, self-control. You know what's always bothered me? Is that a lot of people wait for something to happen to make them appreciate it. All of a sudden, look, I prayed yesterday with a woman who heard me speak just like we're doing. We were doing this last night a little bit farther north. She said, I was diagnosed with cancer. They'd give me seven weeks to live. I'm not religious. Would you pray with me? 
You just think about what I just said. She's not religious, but you know what? She wants somebody to pray for her. Because that's all we got left. Don't wait till that happens. I just gave you the reason. Jesus Christ's death on the cross and His resurrection. That is the reason we put our faith and trust in God Almighty. It's through Jesus. That's how God holds us. That's the gospel. That's the good news. When I heard that at 14, I made a confession that Jesus Christ is Lord. That means I had to deny myself. I was no longer going to wake up and say, okay, it's my life. What am I going to do today? I said, you know what? I'm going to try to be used by God to spread the knowledge of Jesus. And in a divine turn of events, my dad baptized me in the Washington River right out in front of our house in our yard. And here's this man who I had known the worst of, I had seen him come to Christ. And now he was helping me participate in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I realized something right then. That if I'm going to appeal to the forgiveness of God for my sins, then I need to be a forgiver. And I looked my dad in the eyes and I said, all's forgiven. Let's go to heaven together. And since that moment, I have tried to make the most of every opportunity to spread the knowledge of Jesus Christ. It's not about us. I'm not after fame and fortune. Are you kidding me? I laugh every time I hear that. Because I was just as happy without nothing and having Jesus Christ in my heart knowing that I'm forgiven and if I die, I'm going to live forever with the people I love. Fine if he doesn't. Hey, Jesus didn't even have a place to lay his head. I'm not worried about that stuff. So here we are. We come to you. Some of you need to do some soul searching. You know what I mean? We get easily distracted on this earth. I'm here to tell you I'm not a preacher. I'm not trying to uphold some agenda. I'm a believer. 